The story today is about education, education being the great equalizer. But if you're in a low or middle income country, how do you pay for it? Well, maybe you're just going to go to Vatana. And we're going to talk all about Vatano with co founder and CEO Kushal Chakrabarty right here today on Rainmakers TV. Welcome, Kushal. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day outside. Uh, yeah, it is a beautiful day. It's always a beautiful day here, especially though if you're getting into something that uh, that you really love. And tell us a little bit about Vatana, what it does, what its focus is. Absolutely. Vatana's mission is to empower our young people to build a life of opportunity by through education. Um, we believe that education is the single most powerful tool to fight global poverty. And there are young people, young men and women around the world that get Vatana microloans to finish their education. So think of someone who needs. $700 to become a teacher in Rwanda, or $200 to become a welder in the Philippines, or, or $900 to become a nurse in Rwanda. We make it possible for them to get loans to finish their education. And hey. anyone with $25 or $50 can go to vatana.org, www.vatana.org, and support the education of a young person around the world. I think, I think one of the biggest things that, especially for me and for so many of our supporters, is that Education is, is so personal. It, it means something different to each one of us. Mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, it's, it's so universal. It means something to all of us. I mean, Stan, I mean, you and I wouldn't be sitting here without, without that. I mean, you were a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I was an engineer by training. And, and I think that's just what, what Vatana is all about, that education is just this profound tool to, to enable people to achieve opportunity in their life. All right, let's break down a little bit about what you said, because you, you talk about loans as opposed to donations or gifts uh, or scholarships. Yes. It is, you're talking about loans, actually, students who are unemployed and, and live in a country where the average income is under, uh, you know, maybe $3 a day, and you're talking about loans? We're talking absolutely about loans. I think, I think there has always been charity. I think there's, um, there's been lots of different ways that people can help um, young people and, and children around the world, but we, we, we care about sustainability and sus uh, scalability. And a loan um, for $500 or $1,000, yes, you can make that a gift. But the difference is, you know, you can only do that once. You can do that twice. You know, I don't have a million dollars to give out. I have $25 or I have $50. And so, you know, getting repaid, when I make a loan to a student and they repay about 99% of our students repay, they have 99% of our students are successful. You have repay. a 99% repayment rate? Yes, yes, we, we will absolutely. And these are uh, student loans. For students in basically developing countries. Yes, and so so. Well, wait a minute here. Now, how does that compare to the American rate? Um, it, it's much higher. It's almost double. So in the U.S., uh, student loan repayments are, are sub fifty percent. Um, there there are a lot of things that are um, we, we're passionate about education. It um, and the U.S. system. There's a lot of things that um, are important, and the finance is one of those things. But the repayment rate is here much is much less. Hmm. Um, and, and I think it's one of those just absolutely amazing things that these young people earning three or four dollars a day, that, that if you give them a chance, they're, they're not going to give it up. I mean, that's the one thing. I can, I can answer it as a human being and I can answer it as a CEO. Um, but as a human being, you hear these amazing stories of young men and women. Some, you know, uh, one of our students, um, she, was a, she was a farmer. Her, she comes from a farming family mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Her name is Noan. Um, 24, year, 24 years old, she's the first in her family to get an education past the eighth grade. She was not right. earning any money. Her family was earning two or three dollars a day. And she needed a, a, an $800 loan to finish her education. She wanted to be um, working in the lab. She wanted to be a chemist. She wanted to be a chemist mm -hmm. assistant. She had no way of getting this money, but um, she requested um, this loan from Vatana.org um, about two years ago. She's graduated. She's all but paid $32 as a loan. And she's earning nine dollars a day, which is amazing. Wow! Because she tripled the income. She wasn't making any money before. Oh, so, she, so yeah. This is the difference zero. between not making any money working on the farm um, in the rice paddies, and and instead earning now nine dollars a day, earning a real income, being able to support her family, being able to have her own family someday. And it's a completely different level of opportunity here. I think. I think. Um, we often take for granted sometimes the things that we have, but for Noen, this was her one shot. You know, otherwise she was going to stay in a farming family. She was going to be working in the rice paddies for the rest of her life, just like her brother, just like her uh, mom and dad. And she wanted to instead to have a life of opportunity. And more than likely just like her grandparents and, and, and exactly. grandparents before that. And, and it, we come back to this point that we think that education is the single most powerful tool that we have to fight global poverty. I mean, tripling someone's income 
going from three dollars a day to eight dollars a day in Asia is I mean is amazing. I mean it is profound. Like the tripling someone's income that at that level is a lot of money. I mean whether you slice it. But on top of that, the difference between three dollars a day and eight dollars a day is the difference between, you know, you know, if your son gets sick having some savings to be able to take him to the doctor. Mm -hmm. is the difference between having one meal a day or two meals a day is the difference having you know just rice and rice and beans in Latin America versus the rice and beans and maybe you get to have meat for for your children once once a once a week is is absolutely unprecedented. So the strive the to get education is not necessarily health driven. It's not driven by any factor other than primarily given the opportunity then there is a better economy for me and my family. Is that it? I think I think what it really comes down to is that it's 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 I'll put it another way. I think the one thing that is the universal constant on the planet is that what parents want, is that what families want, is for their children to have a better chance at life than they did. Period. I don't care if you go to Jordan, I don't care if you go to Israel, I don't care if you go to Philippines, Vietnam, US, that is the one thing that's constant across every single human being on this planet. We want a better chance for our children than we had. Which comes back to opportunity, which comes back to breaking poverty, but I think it comes down to that. It's about health. It's about education. It's about um, having a stable income. It is about um, it is about reducing birth rate. But I think education is what it comes down to at the end. Now, you talked about at the beginning that you were uh, an engineer. Yes. Uh, yes. But you're talking about education. So how is it? How did you came to do this? How did you start the talk? I think I think education uh, again. It, it, everyone has a personal story about it, and you have one. I have one. But for me, education was really a second chance at life for me. Um, I was lucky enough when I was growing up that I had a couple wonderful teachers um, that really kind of um, helped me come back to uh, come back to my potential. The word potential got used around around me a lot in, when I was growing up. Especially with teenage boys. Huh? Especially with teenage boys. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, so yes, I was trained as an engineer. I worked at Amazon for several years, um, and it was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot. Um, I got to do a lot of amazing things. I got to work with some really uh, fun people, really smart people. Mm -hmm. And I think Amazon was was really a, a proving grounds for a lot of entrepreneurs, um, both for profit and and for good. And in, in my case. Um, I left in June 2007. I didn't really know what I was going to do next. Um, I think the default thing to do after you leave a company like Amazon or Google or Facebook is that you start your own company. That you start mm -hmm. a company like um, you know um, a startup, and you know hopefully that turns into something bigger and you make some money off of that. What drives me, on the other hand, is I really like building useful things. Um, I think money is absolutely something that's useful. There are a lot of useful things that you can do with money. You can. Um, you can support your family. You can you can donate to charity, but it's not the only thing. And so I left, and I had a, a couple ideas. One of which was a um, a for profit tech startup, mm -hmm. um, and another of which was this idea that has now evolved into Katana. Um, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, but I spent a lot of time growing up in India, probably three or four or five years um, over the course of my life. Um, and I, but I remember, on the other hand, I remember reading this New York Times article. That was the crystallizing moment behind Katana. It was talking about this rickshaw driver who was spending something like 30% of his income to send his son to school. 30%? 30%. 30%. And 30% is a lot of money, whether you're making 200 grand a year or 20 grand a year, or in this guy's case, $1,000 a year. Yeah. And that is a lot of money. And I remember thinking, it's like, wow, this guy is amazing. He's, he's look at the commitment to education, look at the commitment to the next generation. This guy is absolutely amazing. Um, I think there's really two ways of looking at this though. And I thought for a little bit more, and said, yeah, this guy is amazing, but he's actually too amazing. For every person that can somehow pull it together, that can somehow you know, save 30% of their income to send their son to school, how many other people are really falling through the path? This guy is amazing, yes, but he is too amazing. And just the kind of person I am, that, that was that was that was, that was a spark of something. There was something there I could feel. I didn't really know what, but I knew I could. It was there. And um, I just started calling anyone that would return my calls. I started emailing anyone that would return my emails. I was probably quite obnoxious back then, to be honest. But people didn't believe that uh, that the idea of microfinance for student loans would work. 
No, they, there were a lot of people that, that didn't, some of them, the experts in microfinance, some of the experts in education. We literally got laughed out of meetings. Um, what do you know about education? They'll never repay. They'll never graduate. And I think, I think, um, I think today, we look at it now, and it's like we, we funded about 1,000 students so far to over 1,000 students in 15 countries. We have a 99% repayment rate. Our students um, have tripled their income on average. I don't think the question today is about whether or not it works, but rather, um, but rather, how do you get from a thousand to ten thousand to a million? When you think about the need for education around the world, it's not one or two students. It's not a thousand students. It's a million. It's ten million, and mm -hmm. that's what we're really out to achieve. Yeah, one of the interesting things is, is that when in microfinance that you talk about so much is that especially if the microfinance borrower is a woman, she is far more likely to put the income that she makes back into her family, particularly for education, and so. You're providing additional assistance, but again, in the form of loans. So it only seems to me that it would work. You know, frankly, I mean, or is there? How does how does Vitana actually work? Absolutely, itself? absolutely. So what we do is that we work in, in developing countries all around the world, and we build some of the world's first student microloan programs in partnership with local microfinance organizations. Mm -hmm. Vitana, over the years, now three years, fifteen countries, we've gotten to know really well what the different parts of um, education um, lending are in, in these countries. And you have to think about what the context of these countries are. There's no infrastructure. There's no IRS. There's no credit bureau. There's no FAFSA. You know, um, in, in many cases, you have loan officers getting on a motorcycle and driving out for two hours to visit the village where um, where some of our students are, are getting a loan. And this is the same story with microfinance. But the question is, how do you make the idea of microfinance work for education? And that's what Vitana has gotten really good at. So we end up often working with um, you know, neighbors or um, people who are part of the community, microfinance community, the children of that community. Um, we end up often targeting technical school and vocational school. There's a specific structure to the loan that makes it work. We have, um, we have, we have um, our, our, our partners, loan officers, meet with the meet with the students every month. And happy to get into all this in a second. But but what really makes what we take all of that knowledge and we work with the local partners um, deep. The knowledge about the local economy, about the local job market, about the local educational um, systems, and really combine that, we launched some of the world's first um, education finance programs for students in these developing countries. Mm -hmm. Those students then appear on www.vitana.org, and you know there are students right now today for, from seven different countries, um, dozens of students from seven different countries studying everything from accounting, wanting to be everything from accountants to be ship captains. Um, it so it's not just getting a college degree in the humanities. Instead, it, it's uh, it can be very useful things leading to getting a job. I think I think what young people really want are, to be honest, I, I think what young people really want are useful skills. They have dreams. They have um, they have things that they want to do in life. I think education has always been about literacy and numeracy. Um, Witness the Millennium Development Goals, child sponsorship for decades, but. That five-year-old child isn't five years old anymore. She's she's twenty. She's twenty-five. Um, she might be wanting to have a family, and how do you support a family? Well, you need to be able to have a job. You need to be able to earn money. You need to be able to take care of them. And so it's really about things that they can get a job in, that they can find something that they can fill an opportunity with. Um, we're going to take a very short break. Just wanted to remind everyone that we're we're with uh, Vitana.org's Kashal Chakrabarti today. And I've done a bad job with his name, and I apologize about that. But you know the thing to do is to go to the website, vitana.org, and make sure that it's up on the screen. And there are many, many opportunities for you to not necessarily make a donation. Sure, you can do that. But maybe the thing to do is to make a loan to someone who's going to have a 99% chance that he's going to pay it back. And that's a good way to participate. So, Kushal. Sorry about that break, but we had to get that in. What I wanted to make sure is that everybody understands how they can help, how they can participate too. And so what you're describing is that someone from Michigan can give a loan to of $25 or participate in a loan of $25 of someone in Nicaragua who's going to become an accountant. I think, I, think, I think money is one of the ways. I think supporting um, being able to donate $25, uh, lend $25 to a student. Um, is absolutely one of the ways, and it's a really powerful and important way because at the end of the day, um, our students need to get their money mm -hmm. to be able to finish their education. But I think there are a lot of other ways. Um, I think the first thing is awareness, and we're trying to create a movement to drive the conversation about global education. Global education has always been about literacy and about education, but you look around the need and the mismatch around the world, it is not about literacy, and it's not about numeracy, it's about 
access to education, it's about access to useful education, things that they can go and do something with that they can achieve their dreams. Um, I, I think I think if you go to our blog, you, you can just uh, blog. It's blog.thetana.org. Um, we are we're creating a movement around what education means to people around the world. And um, actually, just yesterday, we launched a new campaign um, called "What Does Education Mean to You?" with some very prominent uh, people in technology and, and business. Um, Tim Ferriss, um, the author of Four Hour Workweek, um, people from Google, people from Microsoft. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, who's a le legend. You got Google and Microsoft together? Uh, <laughs> wow, you are a magician, aren't you? <laughs> people, from, people from Google and Microsoft. But I think it comes back to this point, right? I mean, I think for everyone, I mean, you and I would not be sitting here, um, none of us would be here where we are today without our education. And that is true for people at Google, that is true for people at Microsoft, mm -hmm. that is true for people at Amazon, that is true for people in every corner of this country and every corner of this world. I don't care who you are. Um, and so we're trying to capture what education really means. And I think the thing that you hear about over and over again for our students is that it means opportunity. There was a, our we just we just funded um, a thousand students. Um, the Vitana community just broke a thousand students funded um, over the weekend. And um, the thousand students, her name was Bernarda. She was a she's a mother. She's in Nicaragua, 28 years old. And um, for her, she talks about how it's really about her family. It's about opportunity, but it's really about her family because she works so hard. She's, uh, there was this amazing quote, and I'm not going to do a good job of re-quoting it, but um, you can go to the website and see her. Um, her quote was, I am a fighter. I have high expectations in my life, and I work hard every day so I can achieve those goals. Everything I do, I do for my son's well-being. And this woman, she wanted to be a nurse. She was a mom, so she didn't really have any money lying around. But she wanted to be a nurse. She was earning $9 a day working just at a random throwaway job. $9 a day. And now when she graduates nur uh, nursing school, she'll be able to earn $20 a day. It's more than double her income. She's going to be able to, she, it's more than double her income to support herself and her son. And it's really amazing. I, I think, I think what it really comes down to is that education really means something to everyone. I think it means opportunity to our students. But whether it's about family, whether it's about empowerment, whether it's about a second chance, as in my case, it is something to everyone. Um, and I think you can go to our blog to read more about that. Yeah, you've actually talked about the blog, and I was reading it. There's some really interesting, uh, interesting things on the blog. One of the things was about education in Mongolia. Yeah. And um, that, is a, that is a country where here in the United States, you, you say the word Mongolia, yeah. and you think of people riding small horses sure. and, you know, or Mongolian beef, for that matter. Or Mongolian beef, and yeah. never having any kind of education. You wouldn't think about education yeah. in Mongolia. You think about it in a different way. We think about education in every um, in every developing country. Mongolia is actually a really interesting country for us to work in, because so many uh, it was a you know Mongolia's history is um, it was it's you know right next to Russia, and, mm -hmm. and many of the many of the people there speak Russian, and has there's been a, a lot of influence over the time, and you look at all these different countries and you look at the need, the mismatch between need and opportunity in every single one of them. And in Mongolia, the need is a little different. In Mongolia, there's um, a lot of students go abroad for education. A lot of students get their education or and then, then leave the country to go elsewhere. It's, the country is really um, centered around the capital of Ulaanbaatar. And what we do there is that we work with an amazing organization called Hospink. And um, they actually have other ways of getting um, tuition support, but they have no way of paying for other expenses. Um, and so we've made it possible for them, in partnership with Hasbank, for students to be able to pay for everything that you need to be able to go to school, that, that things like, um, you know, things like you need to be able to pay for your books, you need to be able to pay for um, the transportation, you need to be able to pay for living expenses. And so today, students in Mongolia are able to um, get loans to be able to pay for that. And once they graduate, they often end up um, going to some, some of the surrounding countries, or, or um, and, and using those, using those, um, using that income to pay off um, their loans to the Tana lenders. Hmm. So there, there is a need for education in Mongolia. At the same point in time, you uh, talk about on your blog the the knowledge economy in Jordan, mm -hmm. uh, and you know uh, here in the United States we have heard an awful lot about the knowledge economy in Israel, but not necessarily so much in Jordan. I think. Uh, 
I think there's a knowledge economy in lots of different countries. I, I, I wouldn't say it's just specific to Jordan necessarily. So I think, um, I, I think, I think the difference between Jordan versus Vietnam versus Peru, for example, um, there are different kinds of professions that that people study in different places. So in Peru, for example, there's a booming hospitality industry. In Philippines, for example, there's a lot of big booming construction industry. In Jordan. It, it's about marketing, it's about business. Many people want to be business men, men and women. I think there, in a lot of countries around the world, there's this profound mismatch of young people who are willing to work very hard to, to break the cycle of poverty for themselves and their families, but don't have, a, for the lack of a $500 or a $1,000 loan, something that we take for granted here, something that we barely pay for you know, a semester's worth of books here is enough for them to finish their education and start a life of opportunity. And I think the professions and, and jobs and the opportunities vary from country to country, but I think Jordan absolutely is a knowledge economy, I think, and has a lot of promise and hope going forward, mm -hmm. and I think is really a, kind of a beacon in, in the Arab world right now. Um, I think Peru is, is also has a lot of opportunity and hope. I think Vietnam also has a lot of opportunity and hope, as does Mongolia and so many of the other countries that we work in. Can education help bring about peace? <laughs> yes, is a short version. I think, I think there's a lot of things that education can play towards. One of the things that we've actually been thinking a lot about is how education plays into um, the needs of youth and the desires of youth. Um, you look at the turmoil that's been happening in the Middle East over the last, uh, the last year, um, earlier this year, and the, the problems are different in every country. Um, in, in Vietnam, it's about access to education. Um, in Peru, it's about access to education. In Jordan, it's about access to education. And it's about different kinds of education. So, for example, it's about, it really comes down to young people. In Egypt and so many of these other Arab countries where there was so much turmoil, there was a lot of talk about you know, um, on, on you know, the Egy Egyptian propaganda or the or, um, um, propaganda from a lot of different places with the, oh, there's American interference. In the US, there was a lot of punditry going on about this is Al Qaeda, this is a lot of different things. And you know, there may have been parts of that, I don't know. But really, I don't think that was the main issue. I think the main issue was that there were these countries that had 20, 30, 40 percent unemployment. And you had young people that had hopes and dreams that wanted to do something with their lives, and they were being denied that. So, getting back to something you said in your very first statement on this show, education is something personal. Education is something very personal. Yes. Let's talk about the fellows program that you have at Batana. That's very interesting. Yes. So, I think I think another way of being involved with Batana is volunteering. And, and just generally donating your time to Vitana. And there are lots of wonderful organizations that do great work. But I think with Vitana, the, there's a number of ways of different getting involved. One of them is the Fellows Program. The Fellows Program allows people who want to get exposure to different countries, who want to work in a different country for three, six, nine months, and really help develop some of the world's first education uh, finance programs in these countries. Um, we have fellows in, in a dozen countries right now, um, from countries like Peru, from countries to Bolivia, to, to Vietnam, to, to Mongolia. Um, and this is an incredible way of getting exposure to a culture that you'd never imagine. I mean, how many people go to Mongolia? I, I, I would never have thought, I would never have thought of I, I know one other person. You know one other person that's more, that's, that's actually the same exact number as me, to be honest. Um, I think it's an incredible way of getting exposure to a country and to a culture that you'd never see otherwise. I think it's a way for people that are passionate about education or about global development or about fighting global poverty to be able to work um, with, with an mm -hmm. organization in a very hands-on way. We, mm -hmm. we, our, our fellows are basically our, our eyes and ears um, and often our hands too. In, in these countries and have been absolutely instrumental in building some of these programs. We only have a couple of minutes left and i got to get to a couple of things. Okay. One of them is scalability. You, mm -hmm. you said uh, you, you've just topped a thousand students, you want to get to 10,000 students and a million students. How can you do that? I think, I think the way it, this has been, we've been growing 10x annually for the last three years. Um, we would, we've only, we're only three years old, but we've gotten a lot of good press, we've gotten a lot of good growth. I think you look at our repayment rates, the idea works. 
there's something to this. Is it working for students too? Are they graduating? Are they getting jobs? Yes, yes. We have a we have a ninety our ninety nine percent repayment rate is also a success rate. That's also that that's the rate at which students are are having success in their lives and finding that opportunity. I think I think, um, but even more than that, I think our income numbers are are prove that. I think I think when a student um, goes from three dollars a day to eight dollars a day, that's really amazing. And on the other side, you look at it. Look at it from our lenders' perspective, right? You know, our lenders are making twenty-five dollar loans and fifty dollar loans to these young people, and they get paid back when the student graduates and when the student. Can so it's not just a gift. It's like um, like some of the other online um, microfinance entities, except this is solely for student loans. This is this is this is for supporting education around the world. Supporting yes, education. Yes, um, but you know, getting paid back twenty-five dollars. Yes, that you know, the, I, I like getting paid back, but. It's not really about getting paid back for me, and I think for a lot of other people. I think what we hear more and more is that, you know, twenty-five dollars is nice, but really, when student, when you give someone a twenty-five dollar loan, they go to school, they graduate, they get a job, and they pay you back. It's not really about the twenty-five dollars, but really, there's no better proof that it worked. For someone to get a loan, to finish school, to graduate, get a job, and then pay you back, there's nothing better to show that it worked. Well, we have an hour show left, and we only have about 30 seconds. So <laughs> with that, who's supporting you? I, your advisory board is very impressive looking. We've been really lucky to be supported by a number of very amazing people from technology and business. Um, we've been really supported by the Amazon network, um, Microsoft, Google, etc. people from Microsoft and Google. Um, you can go out and check it out at www.batana.org. And we're going to be sure to get, to get the website up uh, on it. Kashal, um, Thank you very much for being with us, but thank you even more for what you're doing with student loans because, uh, yeah, education is the equalizer, and what you're doing is uh, helping opportunities around the world. So thank you. Thank you so thank, much for having me. Thank you very much. That's all for Rainmakers. Be sure. Go to the website, vitana.org. We'll see you right here next week on Rainmakers TV. Mm -hmm.